Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner. I'm pleased to be joined by Ed Brubaker. How are you, Ed? Hey, good. Good to have you. Good to good for uh, good to be here. Sorry, it's good <laughs> a little early my time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining me, mate. Um, uh, we were talking off camera about uh, uh, a recent piece of uh, sad news. Sad for, sad news for us today is that the mighty John Romita has just passed away. Who I know yeah. is a big favorite, a big favorite of yours. My, yeah yeah my probably i was thinking about it and i realized i might not have fallen so in love with comics you know had i had like ramita not been like working on the art on spider-man when i was a kid you know like because yeah. my first comic book memories are like probably the gil kane john ramita spider-man issues like when i think about it like the yeah. ones that I can vividly remember, like just, and just the way he drew all those characters walking around in New York City and, you know, going to the, going to the coffee bean and all that stuff. Like just, just, uh, I don't know, there was just something about the world that that guy created that just sort of made me fall in love with the idea of drawing comics. And I think I spent probably 10 years trying to like figure out how to draw like John Romita or something, you know, before I gave up on that. <laughs> but I think that was a big reason that I sort of fell in love with comics was just how how amazing he made everything look. I'm working on like a big article for my newsletter about it where I'm sort of how wonderful. I spent yeah. most of the morning just like looking trying to find like cool pieces of art from him and I'm like wow there's just too many to choose from I could the newsletter could be six feet long you know <laughs> just like John Romita art because it's so amazing I, I mean he he really excelled with beauty on the on the page didn't he that was, he was so great yeah looking. everything looks so lovely on a Romita page yeah I mean and the romance comic thing like yeah. when you see like his old art when he was first starting and he just drew romance comics and stuff and it was just it's it's really weird because if you start looking close at, at what he draws like it's almost like he would have been great for crime comics like the way he draws backgrounds and there's this this spider-man cover i saw that's got like a big it's almost like a eisner cover where it's like spider-man above like a rioting crowd and he's like i don't care anymore and the but if you look at the rioting crowd it looks like mobsters from the 50s <laughs> like i don't know what's going on here but it's amazing <laughs> but uh yeah no i just i just loved his his art so much i got to work with them twice i i got him to do a fake romance comic cover for an issue of daredevil that was all told yeah. from Mila's point of view that yeah. was drawn by Lee Weeks, actually, who's a, obviously a big Ramita guy. Yeah. Um, and then I got him to do two pages in Daredevil 100 in the middle of a dream sequence, like a little Matt and Karen uh, scene uh, that was like a tortured romance comic moment. And I think I recall him telling our editor that he had no idea what was going on in this comic <laughs> <laughs> but, but was flattered that i had written something specifically like for him to try to draw in his old style so what a great moment that must have been though that's wonderful I didn't, yeah i didn't actually get to have any conversations with him ever i always hope to meet him at a convention or something and just say hi but like what i him and uh gene colon I, I wrote the last comic that gene colon drew which he was drawing for about four years so um, i what, I what was that again Ed? You, the, it was a captain america annual um that he drew and stefano gaudiano sort of did finishes over he did like a digital finish over gene's pencils so that we could really see what gene had drawn and i think marvel even published like a black and white pencil edition of that um, but that was really interesting because I would get phone calls from Gene Colon for, you know, every couple of months for, uh, you know, three or four years. And that was kind of nice. Yeah, that was, must have been was, fantastic. fantastic. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was like right. It was right after my dad died. So I had kind of decided to adopt Gene Colon as my stand in father yeah. figure. And he would call up and just want to talk about movies and stuff. And he was a projector nut. Like my yeah. wife is a projector nut. He was like really excited that we had a, like a old Bell and Howe Sando film, which stopped working in the in the 15 years since then. <laughs> but for a while, we had a, a 16 millimeter projector that worked that she, my wife had just found it at a, at a, a thrift store in San Francisco one day, like in the early 90s or something and just carried this like 100 pound thing home <laughs> that, that that's what i call a, like an enviable story of connecting with your heroes that's a, just about as good a connecting with the one of your hero stories i think as i could possibly imagine 
Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, the him and his wife, uh, yeah, I was in communication with both of them, like, right up until before they died, it was tragic, um, but, uh, yeah, it was, but, yeah, that was just, you know, being able to draw that, to, to work on that comic with Gene, and sort of get to see his process, because even though I gave him a full script, he totally did it Marvel style anyway. <laughs> didn't worry about where the dialogue was going to go yeah. change scenes around and what he wanted to draw instead it was, oh, <laughs> absolutely this is a brilliant. fucking nightmare on one level <laughs> on another level it was like oh shit this is like a flashback to the 70s this is what marv wolfman and these guys were going through <laughs> you know like oh well how do i make this work okay well, fine. Fine. but it was it was a lot of fun actually but because uh, if you're going to have marvel style you want it to be like one of those guys you know? uh yeah, of course, of course. I mean, that, it seems to me that's the perfect experience, really. And yeah. uh, to segue, the only so other one I would have loved to, I would have loved if like, I could have got John Byrne to come back and do something. Except, oh sure man, yeah, screamed at me the entire time. Or something. <laughs> yeah, like, a bunch he was my other like notes. childhood, like you know, like his yeah. his Captain America, like seven issues or whatever, are still like among the best Captain Americas and. Uh, we were yeah. just asking him to come do a cover or something and it was like no well it, it it's interesting because one of your I, I remember distinctly when the guys who turned me on to uh your captain america run like in the early 2000s uh i was at my local comic shop and i was i was this is long before i worked here for been planet and and um when they were going oh yeah you really want to be reading this i'm like so i i don't really <laughs> want to because i love captain america so much yeah <laughs> but it's been so badly written over the years that the only only the only times i've really enjoyed it since stan and jack and since you know joe and jack was uh was burn and stern and then yeah. uh, wade and garnier said the rest of it i can't stand reading it. and they're like no you've you've got to persevere like you've got to read i this like book. the the Dematty Zek stuff has a lot of fun. Oh stuff. yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah that had a lot. But yeah, of yeah. There's the, Captain America was always one of those books that had like standout moments. You know, yeah. I felt like as a as a person who grew up reading it, it was like one of those one of those many comics that you just continued to buy out of loyalty. Yeah. That, but every now and then there'd be like an oasis in the drought. <laughs> you know, like at least in the like seventies and eighties. Like, uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that I, was... I, I think when you came on board and started portraying him as a soldier, which is was the big for me was the big turning point, the thing that completely made sense. You know, I just but, got lucky. I, yeah. I got there at a time when they were willing to like shake things up, and you know they had had some success with sure. you know, with the ultimate line of you know sort of treating the violence a little bit more real. So, oh, good. We've killed time talking about everything else. <laughs> right on. Yeah, th this is the the natural segue point from uh, yeah. Romita and I'm your strong. heroes and Captain America. It's all good. But his camera's not on. <laughs> hey, Sean. How are you doing? Oh, oh there you are. Hello, yeah. Sean. <laughs> we were Sorry, just talking totally about John Romita. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, shame, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. very sad. I know you, you, you're a big fan as well, right, Sean? Yeah, of course I am, yeah. Yeah, everyone. Yeah. Would have been the first Spider-Man I saw back you know, 50 years ago. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I yeah, think I, I think that same 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 was true for all of us. And um, thank thanks for thanks for thanks for joining us at the at the end of your your, your working Sorry day, Sean. Sure. And um, I'm not I'm, finished yet. <laughs> oh right, okay. <laughs> Deadline crunch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks for interrupting your working day. <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> we, we're here to talk about your your, your new book your uh noir head fuck um um a, a, a special like one-off storyline a, 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 a night fever so um could you tell me as much about it as you preferred as you prepared to talk about it you know sight and scene because everybody watching this is is yet to purchase is yet to purchase and and we're about a week out from it coming into the store in the uk as oh, we okay. record well it's Sean for years had been asking to do something not set in America right. <laughs> and um and so I, I think just after the five reckless books uh we just needed to do something different and um I'd had this idea that I'd been you know mulling over for about a decade about a guy who can't sleep and goes out and sort of 
finds another world in the night um, just because I've on and off been an insomniac in my life. And you think about stuff like that all the time. Um, and so I finally figured out a way to crack it when I was thinking about Sean wanting to draw something set in like the UK or Europe. I was like, oh, what if it's like a guy on a trip to another country or something? And then he's like in a more disorienting place. And so it's about a guy. It takes place in the late 70s. And it's about a, a guy. He's a foreign licensing, foreign rights uh, bookseller for um, a publisher in the US who's going to like a big book fair in France. And yes. Yeah basically something disturbing happens to him on the way over and he's unable to sleep for a while. And you're not a hundred percent sure how real anything that happens to him after that is, I hope. <laughs> Though all of it's. <laughs> it, uh, so what I've seen thus far are the, are the, uh, the preview pages that you've shared on, on your newsletter that you guys have done, but um it, it looks very much Sean like you're you're taking a a different approach to the one that we've become familiar with in Reckless of late. Um, the the imagery to me, it looks a looks a tad more kind of exaggerated, you know, sort of unreal almost in some respects. How is it how has it been putting together the book visually? Um, I'm not sure if it is more exaggerated actually. Um, it's different, yeah, because I've had to draw you know, something else. Um, originally what I thought about doing something set in Europe was um, I went to Venice a few years ago and sat there for a week thinking, oh, it'd be really cool. We could do a book set in Venice, but then I came to my senses, obviously, because that'd be really difficult. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'm excited Venice. about it. <laughs> they said, now I'm all excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a business trip then, isn't it, Ed? If we go to Venice for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And right. walk yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the only difference really is the fact that yeah, it's different type of architecture I'm used to drawing. Like you say, I'm used to drawing American stuff. Um, it's a long time since I've drawn British architecture, which would have been in, you know, Hellblazer 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, so there was a di that difference. Um, when Ed first talked about doing the European book, um, I was hoping for cold Europe. I was hoping for, you know, Prague or um, Helsinki or somewhere where I could draw sort of Russian influenced architecture and stuff like that. But Ed hasn't been to cold Europe. He's only been to hot Europe. So, yeah. um, so we said <laughs> it was going to be either i didn't realize there was a difference really oh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny because yeah, i was, was looking cool. at all these like Bilal books and mobius and stuff and it's like i guess Bilal i always think of as cold europe but i guess he's yeah, i guess he's but, i mean yeah but, well france gets cold um yeah. i was hoping for snow and rain and like lots of nighttime stuff um that i got to draw hot stuff instead so it's 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 not mentioned in the book but it's set in Angoulême because uh, interesting. I've, been, I've been there quite a few times yeah. and um, it seemed to have everything that the story needed. We didn't, um, it, and if it didn't, it didn't really matter because you don't name it. So I can always bring in, you know, a port, yeah. a port or um, a tram if we needed a tram and stuff like that, but we didn't need all that stuff in the end. So it works out okay. So, I mean, even though we don't mention it, yeah, it's, it's on Glam. So a lot of it was based on having been there, um, and lots of Googling as usual, but the architecture is much more, is older, crumblier, yeah, more, more curves, less straight lines. Um, and there's a lot of um, raw iron railings and balustrades and stuff and um, stairways and stuff like that. So that was what informed the cover as well for having the sort of curly um, design yeah. element part of the book. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if, I'd, if it really was that exaggerated. I've, I've read a review where it says um, some of the expressions on people's faces are more, I think that's Outboard. what I think that's what I'm thinking. Um, but that's I wasn't thinking that when I drew it. They just came out like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't, it does have but, like a little know, bit. If it, of, uh... than, if it sounds better than I did on purpose, then yeah, I did on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a little bit of a like a Fellini satiricon kind of quality in in some places. I thought. I'll have to take your word for that. I've not seen none of that stuff. But... <laughs> I, 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 I was getting a bit of that as well. It, it, it's it's interesting because, uh, well, it's interesting to me because I used to publish Caille du Cinema, which is the French movie magazine. Yeah. I, I lived for Paris. I lived in Paris for you when I did that. And I've had that experience as a lifelong insomniac of walking around some of those older arrondissements, as they're called, in the middle of the night with all that great raw time stuff knocking around. And it almost has a completely unreal feeling to it particularly if you're struggling to sleep and you see lots of weird stuff lots of weird sculpture that feels like it comes from another era so to me 
Uh, it's fascinating hearing you saying it's it's based on Angoulême, which of course is the ideal place for a literary rights person to be. Yeah, of course. It, yeah, it'd be nice for the French version as well when that comes out. Really yeah, yeah. Winning the war. <laughs> we don't specify it's Angoulême, but I'm guessing everyone in France will recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Sean, can Our you talk French a bit about especially? <laughs> can you talk a bit about your process because you illustrated this one in a, in a different format to usual, right? Oh yeah, do you have any uh, of the art there? Uh, I can, I can. If you talk for a minute, I can go and get. Right on. Uh, I, okay, yes. Uh, okay, so I've got what, what, what? Well, uh, Sean's having a look. So, so one Sean of the... hasn't seen seen Satyricon, but I have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I was going to say one of the bigger influences on this book for was uh, I I wanted us to do something that when I was a kid growing up, I used to have to sneak heavy metal into the house. Yeah. And like, I wanted us to do something that if you'd seen, if you'd just picked up a random issue of heavy metal in 1980 or something, and this was the middle, like hundred pages of a 200 page magazine, it would have just blown you away. You like, but, but wouldn't all, wouldn't have felt totally out of place, you know, like that was part of the intent. But I also, when I was working on the script, thought about, you know, like Lynch and Fellini and stuff like that a lot, like trying yeah. to do one, you know, going you know deep into that kind of crazy uh space of noir you know yeah. where it's a little bit a little bit more surreal and weird yeah the cut the lost Just... highway of it if you will and I, I yeah, was thinking exactly. more about, yeah. sorry oh go ahead no i was gonna say i was thinking more about the um sort of um practicalities of drawing a french influenced album um things like uh, blueberry and stuff like that would yeah. often be drawn on two sheets of paper the so every page would have a horizontal gutter in the middle so i i thought i'd that'd be one little nod i'd do for, for it looking french so i drew it big so that's half a page yeah, there look at that you see that yeah so right that's, that's a three size whatever that is in american i don't know yeah. 11 by 17. um so that's the top half of the page and the bottom half of the page and then wow. they get joined together obviously when i drew it but that means that every page has got that horizontal um gutter in it which is the first time Ed and I have ever done anything that isn't three tiered since yeah. we started criminal, you know. So, but I told Ed not to worry about it as far as writing it, and I'll just sort of figure it out when it comes to drawing it. So yeah, so because I did it in two halves, I could draw a lot bigger as well. Yeah. So it's, it's two hundred percent of printed sides. Yeah, so it's like as big as the. Uh, I was like I was saying, I was looking at my Wallywood uh, artist edition because I, I broke out my John Romita artist editions this morning to look at, and then yeah, I saw the Wallywood yeah. one. I was like, oh, Sean's art is as big as this Wally Wood one in this book. <laughs> like, because that one is so big, you need like a whole display case for it. <laughs> no, it so how are you, are you selling the pages uh, in two halves or how do you? Um, how you I think if, if I sell them, they're going to, you have to buy both halves. You can't just yeah. buy the, the best half. I was we left with <laughs> the Gregs when I, so um, I, don't I don't know. Yeah, I haven't thought about it really, but um Sean, yeah. were you able to just step into 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 doing it and, and working at that size without any problems? And the reason I ask is maybe this is an apocryphal story, but I always used to hear from some of the guys at DC and Marvel, you know, the Bob Waynes and, and the like, is that some of the when they reduced the artwork size, basically the artists of the day were split into two camps. Somebody whose work you could never really tell the difference before and after, Selby Summer, John B. Summer. And then people who on some level struggled with it and their art wasn't ever quite the same again, like Kirby and like Ditko. Did did you working the other way around, did you did you feel it was um, a challenge at all? The, well the, the one thing that stayed the same is I pencil digitally, so that's always the same size. Yeah. Um and then it just got blown up to print out to ink over the top. So as I was putting the pages together, that for that half of the job, there was no difference whatsoever. And when I came to ink the pages, even though they're bigger, I could just use a bigger brush. I could use a lot more brush than I'd usually use. A lot, usually I use a lot of pen work, but this way I could do a lot more brush. Um, Did you move your arm more? Yeah, I think so, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, juicier marks, um, more interesting mark making, I think, that came across. Um, so it didn't really make much difference as far as how, um, detail the pencils were because that's because it's digital it's I a think, digital process as much as I like. yeah um and it wasn't it didn't take any longer either because i could use a bigger brush and move my whole arm um <laughs> it meant that the pages didn't really take any any different time you know 
Do, do, is it something you think you'll stick with, or do you think you'll just um, you might oscillate in and out? Well, we've almost finished the next book anyway, and that's gone back in three tiers yeah. because mostly because Ed prefers writing like that. Um, I just need to know what tears are <laughs> <laughs> it was hard to not worry about the tears if we do another four tiered one i think i would i need to think of it knowing what the tears were going to look like just for my because i started yeah. writing comics when i was drawing comics so it's it's really hard for me to like just think of each page as a unit and not each tier as a unit too so that was a little but you know i like the result a lot i think it i think it ended up being you know I mean, I think it's one of the best things we've ever done, if not the best oh, yeah, thing so, yeah. we've ever done. Yeah, I think maybe next time, not the one I'm drawing now, obviously, really finished, but next time, this three-tier book, I might draw it in three pieces. Just, oh, so just so I can keep it big. It's a lot easier, well, because I can't print it any bigger than A3 when I'm printing digital pencils out, so I can't do 200% on one piece of paper. So there needs to be a join somewhere. And it's best if it's in the gutter, isn't it, rather than halfway through someone's face. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe I'll yeah, I might ink it in three pieces, but I'll, I'll see. I'll see. I'll see. That's interesting. Goes. Stefano used to do that for uh, Michael's stuff uh, on Gotham Central when he wanted to ink it bigger. Oh yeah. Uh, because of the, of the detailed crowd scenes of the and all the the stuff inside the police wow. station. Sometimes he would he'd get the because Michael would send him the scanned pencils, so he'd print it out. And sometimes he'd blow them, blow them up, and print them bigger, and then scan it and put it all together. Yeah, you know, and sent it in. Which oh, no, I Alex believed did that with scan stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah Alex believed it like that. He did it panel by panel. In, in yeah, I think that might be where Stefano got it from. Was yeah. the Malieve's process. Yeah, I, I think it's fully digital at this point. I think a lot of people are. I don't know. I think yeah. I'd, I'd struggle a little bit with. I'd like to see the whole page as well while I'm inking because then you can. Yeah figure out where to put the blacks and where to put the more more detail or leave stuff out. But even having it in two halves took that away a little bit. So I think it, if it was in three or more, it'd be more, more difficult. So, so you weren't you able to say, you, you weren't in a place where you could only have one of the panels on one of the halves of the page on your drawing board at the same time. You couldn't. Oh, like no, it. I mean, they'll both be there, but they're not that close yeah. together. They would yeah. be if it, on one piece of paper. I don't know. I'll think about it. I always like to try something different anyway. Um, every project yeah and, and i i i think i i think i read that you you came up with the the cover fairly late in the process is that right sean um After yeah you the book <laughs> finished drawing the book yeah sean finished yeah. drawing the book and then two days later he's like i think i want to do a different cover after yeah. he'd been so happy with the first cover <laughs> <laughs> yeah but this, it was a better idea yeah, what, oh, it's a great cover. What, yeah, it, look, it looks amazing. So where did it come from, Sean? What was the uh, spur? I just, I just had a flash of inspiration. I don't know. Yeah, Not yeah like that me. design I element. I, I felt like maybe you would were coming up with the design element for the book or something, and then suddenly had a new idea for a cover with the yeah, with maybe the yeah, and the and the mask. Yeah, the which, sort of, yeah, the sort of scrolls, you know, the squirrely bits were yeah for part of the design thing, and then the mask thing just sort of popped into my head. It, it was much easier once I'd drawn the book, obviously, because when I drew the first covers before we'd done anything else, and I don't really know enough detail of books to get a good cover out of it, it's much easier afterwards. But that's not the way. Yeah. It's not the way solicitations work anymore, and Amazon and stuff. Yeah, good. yeah. I, and I, I guess this, this ties in with you. <clears throat> well, you did the you did the cover for the next one after you were you'd seen a lot of the script. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I was quite happy with the, the book. book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So the the um the, uh, that's what I was thinking. We, we, we were talking. We might have been talking off camera actually. Just about the fact that now you've you've um now that you're working so far ahead on essentially graphic novel releases, this process of talking about about the book as it comes out is more analogous to being in the movie or TV industry. You work on something and you do the press like eighteen months, you know, a year later. <laughs> yeah. You know, rather yeah. than so, <laughs> yeah, I, I had to look through the book again. I had to look through the book. That's what I was gonna ask you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I I looked at my copies when they arrived in February or March or whatever. <laughs> like uh yeah, no, I but I was I was saying like, but when in monthly comics, I think this is much more satisfying because we actually talk about a book when it's getting released, whereas in monthly comics we talk about a book six months before it comes out when we announce it. And then 
you know, maybe the book gets some press when issue one comes out, but by issue three, nobody's writing about the book or interviewing you about the book anymore, you know, and it's like, and then when the trade paperbacks come out, you're on to the next thing already. So it's like this way we, you know, talk about the book when it's announced and then the book comes out and then we get to, you know, actually push the book for, and, you know, I, I feel like the end result becomes the thing that we're actually putting our, our uh, energy into trying to get out the word on. You know, yeah, and, and yeah, it's much easier, much easier to talk about it when you've got the actual book in your yeah. hands. Definitely. Yeah, and it gets rid of my fear of people who like who read the first three issues of a thing and never read the final three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like those, that's what, that's the thing that keeps me up at night is all those people who read the first issue of the Fade Out that never read issue twelve. <laughs> uh, be my wife, she only read the first issue. <laughs> Like not happy, don't like it. <laughs> uh, well, she's never read, that's the only comic of mine she's ever read. Oh, <laughs> doesn't really get comics. Well, that, that itself is an upside. What was it about? <laughs> what was it about the fade out that particularly attracted it? Was the subject matter? Um, I'm I, I was probably much more persuasive than I usually am. Uh, <laughs> yeah, taken interest. Damn. I've taken it as a as a. I mean, my wife reads our books eventually, usually, but. Now that I know that she's not reading them immediately, I've taken it as sort of like a, ah, well, nobody I care about is going to read this other than Sean. So <laughs> yeah, you, you can I can write anything I want. I can show how I can show the true demonic nature of my humanity <laughs> without yeah. fear of her seeing it. <laughs> I get in your head, yeah. <laughs> And for, for Night Feverers, uh, Jacob pursued a, a different colour palette because he's been focused very much on that kind of the washed out sort of bleached out LA thing in, in Reckless, which looks brilliant, amazing. But I'm just wondering if this has allowed him to, you know, explore kind of lusher, you know, European tones. Yeah, I think so. I mean, he's not, you know, we haven't done it. There's no sunny pages in Night Fever. Well, yeah. Hardly. yeah. So he's had a lot of night stuff. So he's had to change his colour palette. Um, and it's, it doesn't have to be very realistic, so it's, it gives him free reign to go and colour things weird colours if he wants to. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't think he thinks about it that much when he does it. It just sort of comes out of him, just instinctive. Yeah, yeah. I think. So. Yeah, I was just emailing with him the other day about the new book, and uh, I definitely get the sense that he's just sort of goes scene by scene, figuring out what's a fun colour palette, and just loves that he doesn't have to stay within the lines. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it really does, you know, it's so funny now. I can't imagine, you know, ever having to have another colorist than Jake um, because I just can't, you know, it's it's so crazy when I when we get the pages from him just to see what he, what choices he's made now. And only rarely am I like, eh, maybe maybe too much, <laughs> maybe too crazy. <laughs> but usually I like if I look at it again i'm like oh i see what he's doing there like for the new book he's doing he's given each little chapter in it a completely different color palette which is insane but fun yeah you know? but yeah i think he's just trying to keep himself entertained while you know while we basically have forced him to color our books for the rest of his life yeah. well, at least I mean, the rest of ours <laughs> he's, so, he's so busy with his own stuff that he doesn't have time to think about the color for us you know he has to color 10 pages a day just to make a deadline so i think it does really does fall out of him yeah well it's too it's like when you're you know i mean you you know it sean but it's like when you get into the groove on a thing you know the hardest part is to stop so you know oh, yeah. it's getting to color like the whole book straight through basically as opposed to a week every month of coloring a comic is probably a lot better oh yeah it definitely helps yeah yeah i mean he's doing he's only just started coloring the book the other day and He'll do the whole thing in one go. So the next book, yeah, yeah, that's okay. we've already that's seen. Great. I've seen like the first fifty pages or something so far, about 40, 50 pages. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how long does it take one. Jacob if he's doing it all in one go? How long does it take him to to color? What, what kind of to color the whole book? Um, two or three weeks. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, it's like please. Huh? Well, he's doing other stuff probably too. Yeah, he's doing other stuff. <laughs> he's keeping no, up with us. He can do he can do 40, 50 pages a week. Holy but shit. he's he's trying to juggle it with two monthly comics and a graphic novel yeah. is also drawing. <laughs> yeah, because he's got he's, he's inherited he's inherited everything from Sean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> he's inherited his talent and his drive and and the ability to Speed. hit deadlines like yeah. any i people talk about it other cartoonists talk about the phillips family <laughs> <laughs> The Phillips, the Phillips have an art machine. Comics. Yeah, I mean, he's got yeah. he's got new burns on it, and he's got. I saw he had the Enfield gang massacre coming, which is with his, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. yeah he's, just, like, he's just having the pencils for that today. He's not, he's penciled the first issue of that. Yeah, it's a Texas Blood spinoff thing. Yeah, um, it looks great. It's a kind of a prequel deal, right? Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's yeah. set in the in the in the old west, and he's also doing a graphic novel with Francis Ford Coppola as well. So, well, there we go. You no, know, yeah. he's got too much work. Yeah. Oh my God! But he's got to carry. You know, my stuff comes first. Our stuff comes first. You know, to... yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Quite rightly so. Yeah. Never mind the hand that feeds it. Gwen makes the money. He has to do that one anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean, have you done any more? Um, have you done any more uh, DVD Blu-ray stuff recently? Any more? Any more covers? Um, I've done a couple for a new Canadian DVD company you just started up. Um, that just packaged Canadian films. So I did one called. Mm, Gita, I think, about uh, it's like a dancer in a Alaskan factory town that gets into trouble. Yeah. Um, wow. But that was like six months ago. I haven't done anything for yeah. a while. I'm trying to t say no to all that sort of stuff and just concentrate on getting the books done. I've got one lined up when I finish the next book in, next month. Um, I can't remember what it is. It's a Nicolas Cage film, but he's done a thousand films, hasn't he? So, I, he has indeed. Yeah. I couldn't tell you which one it was. Yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> all right. I want that. I'm going to need that art, whatever, if Nick Cage is on it. <laughs> my wife's it's a huge be, nick cage fan <laughs> no, it's, gonna, it's gonna be digital i'm afraid i won't be ah, all right well we'll get a poster <laughs> <laughs> guys can we take take a, a step back i remember something oh, sure. i wanted to, to ask you about about night fever was uh, so i i read i think it was something you'd written actually that this came, came out from a particular place in your life so you're in a particular mindset when you're writing it and the constituent it sort of influences were the the, the 70s Euro comics you talked about, that the heavy metal thing, but also having worked with Nicholas Winding Refn. And, um, oh, yeah. Uh, could you talk about, uh, talk about that for a sec? Yeah. Well, one of the things that was, you know, going on when I started writing the book, I was, I was going through like a really hard time personally with just some family health stuff um, that, you know, I don't want to talk about really, but... Of course, yeah. But, of course. Um, but just sort of a lot of time in hospitals and places like that. And, um, and it, I don't know, there was just something about the idea of it and putting it in Europe that just totally made me think about all the years working with Refn and his sort of crazy improvisational process. And I'd been wanting to write a thing, you know, like he's such a character. And if you watch his movies, there's always characters in his movies that are sort of like, in my mind, like uh, every director has a character that's sort of like their stand in in the movie in a way, or their sort of, I guess they call it Mary Sue's in comics. <laughs> but, um, but Nick is such a character and I really wanted to write somebody in a book that was like that, that also was sort of about my, that, uh, that examined my kind of relationship to sort of being in his orbit for a few years because it definitely is like a being, you know, in the orbit of a different planet, uh, you know, when you're like this crazy, you know, Danish director who <laughs> like, you know, wears a blanket on set and, you know, goes to set every day and looks at whatever we're going to film and decides to change a bunch of it. <laughs> you know, like He's just a really sort of, uh, you know, it's like he's almost like an old Hollywood type of character. But he also likes to give, you know, big speeches a lot and stuff. And he's kind of this uh, mischievous kind of character. And so, yeah, the character of Rainier in uh, in the book, or Rainier, is uh, is sort of loosely uh, an inspiration to both him and and sort of like the kind of characters that he would want to put into things. Yeah. Um, which I told him ahead of time. I was like, "Hey, I've I've got a character who's sort of based on you in this book." <laughs> you know, I didn't tell him what happens to the character. <laughs> He'll have to find out when he buys his copy. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of it was just the um, you know, you go to lunch with Refn at a Hollywood you know place, and suddenly people are coming out of the woodwork to walk over to the table to meet him, and you know, it's just like the rarefied air of it all really, um, you know, 
was was kind of uh, a thing that I was fascinated by to to be part of and was really glad that I met him at a point in my life when I was older and jaded and also like just tired because <laughs> it's like it's very hard to impress me with that kind of stuff <laughs> you know? but um but it was a lot of fun to to sort of be around that world for a while you know like I mean Darius Kanji came to shoot our show because they were both at an event at Cannes together while we were in like pre-production and he came home from Cannes and he was like hey so Darius Kanji is going to shoot the show man and I was like uh like my favorite living cinematographer okay sure just because he'd been at can like two days before that so it's like that's the life he lives you wow. know <laughs> so like, like in effect like one of the old larger than life directors here whether it's john houston or oh Jay definitely Hughes. larger yeah. than life director yeah. and i think you'll the 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 larger than life directors that are allowed to exist still are the, are the like crazy european ones because they're they're allowed to be crazy <laughs> no one's 100 percent sure if it's just the accent or if they're actually crazy <laughs> so they get to be larger than life and demand final cut and things like that that everyone else is like but ai's coming <laughs> you know? yeah, well, yeah. And, and, and because i guess his work at you know talking about what what you've been talking about with regard to night fever and the tone of it his work really does have that kind of you know unreal dreamlike nightmare like quality i mean in your in, yeah. in your show with in your show with Raffin till today and i think the those sequences with the, like the dastardly pornographers out in the desert have this just this very strange and and threatening feeling to them you know oh, before yeah. you his, see anything happen i think his work is, is is inspired you know by his nightmares as much as you know the things that he you know wants to wants to put on screen but he's very much a real artist like he doesn't give a fuck if anyone likes it or watches it or you know like he's not going to change it to make it appeal to more people he's definitely like you know he wants to be like a Jodorowsky or somebody you know just uncompromising artist so it's interesting to to work with somebody like that because it was the first time I'd ever worked with anybody incredibly successful who didn't give a fuck if people liked what he did you know I was like, oh, okay, I should be like that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it must be great to live in a world like that where you can be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he does care. If you watch that documentary his wife made about him where he's looking at all the reviews for Only God Forgive, <laughs> yeah, right, clearly right. does care. Yeah. But, you know, when he works on the thing, like, at the, he doesn't second guess it at the, at the moment of, like, is this going to please more people? It's always about, like, is this going to be the thing I need it to be? Which is which is a really fascinating thing that not enough artists, you know, do. I think you know, you got like people like Scorsese or like that probably. Yeah. You know. It doesn't appear that there's that, there's that many of them. The the other thing that I wanted to mention was um, you. The other thing you mentioned was uh, was Black Lizard, which is uh, that 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 fantastic uh, imprint noir yeah. crime imprint from the eighties. Actually, a big uh, big influence on us because. One of the yeah. things that we do here at Titan is we, we, we publish Hard Case Crime with Charles Ardai. And yeah. that was part of the vibe that I know inspired Charles in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Hard Case is like our our generation's version of yeah. Black Lizard. Yeah, because I discovered those Black Lizard books when I was a teenager going into used bookstores and stuff. And yeah. I, and it, I, the Black I, Lizard, but in its real form, burnt bright for only about six or seven years. But it's a an amazing yeah. period of time with not just Jim Thompson, but the other authors, Williford, all those guys. Yeah. It's amazing stuff. Yeah, that's where I discovered a lot of that stuff originally. Um, those those really, yeah, those the really low, low budget Black Lizard ones that first before they sold to Ballantyne. Random House, yeah. Before the Random year. House, yeah, yeah, yeah. But even the Random House ones, those first few years had some really great stuff. The, the Far Cry is still one of my yeah. favorite that's books cool. ever, probably. But yeah, that was the the that was that other influence, like that heavy metal crossed with like that black lizard kind of. Uh, Sean doesn't know any of. <laughs> Sean knows heavy metal. <laughs> um, but the the idea of trying to do that kind of a noir story where you know it's about a person who just keeps getting in deeper, you know, which is like I I love those kind of noir stories, and we haven't really done one probably since Bad Night, I think. I, and I guess that's what fuels the nightmare quality, as well as the, the the clear kind of dreamscape that's written in the nightmare quality is as you get pulled into that sense of dread and those things you can't quite control. You know, it's uh, one thing feeds the other, right? 
Yeah. I think it's a real, you know, I think it, it's so different than anything else that's on the stands right now. And also so different than anything that we've done while still feeling like our work, I think, you know, but, um, but yeah, that I, you know, it was, it was another one, like, like all these books, by the time we're done with them, I've looked at them so many times, I can no longer tell if they even work. And I have to show it to friends to be like, is this good? And they're always like, what is wrong with you? This is great. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, thank God. <laughs> but um, I feel like that about all these graphic novels when we finish them now, because when we're when well, on the monthly stuff, it's like you kind of get feedback every month from people. But you finish, you know, you spend six months on a book and then you're like, is this good? Like, I know all the art's good. <laughs> you know, but I always worry about my part. Like, did I do it right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you guys uh, are at the point where you really should be having more faith in the response to your own work because it's, uh, <laughs> I think you've been remarkably consistent. Hey, d d am I right? I always worry that this is going to be the one that lets people down. Uh, but, <laughs> isn't that just natural, creative, artistic tension, though? I mean, if you don't have that, you know, you can't get anything done. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I hope, right? Like, yeah. you never want to get to the point where you're just like, ah, they're going to love this, <laughs> you know, like, because that's when you start doing your real shitty work, I think, as a as a creator, probably, is when, you, when you're just so self-satisfied. At least that's what I tell myself as I continue to, <laughs> <laughs> to do an inhuman workload. <laughs> I, I, I think that is the, the, the right mix, though. Am I right in thinking that you've got... Um... Charles you to do the pull quotes for you yeah yeah that's yeah a, that was very convenient so he's an interesting choice because interior Chinatown is that's a great piece of work yeah he's an amazing novelist and short story writer but also uh was in the office next to mine at Westworld so I I had a I had, a, I had an easy yeah. hit okay for yeah. Charlie to read the book on a very tight di ti uh, timeline right before his TV show started production. <laughs> like I need this quote in two days. <laughs> but uh, but yeah no it was it was it was funny because I'd been wanting to get a quote from Charlie for a while and then he won the National Book Award and I was like oh now you're famous. Yeah. <laughs> but um but yeah no that was i was so he was one of the first people to read the finished uh version in color actually i think he might have been the first person outside of our friends to even see that and uh, yeah i was really thrilled to to be able to get him but yeah i was shocked to i was worried he wouldn't be a big enough name and then everybody at image was so excited that we got him and i really think everybody at the publisher like not only knew him but knew his work and i was like oh wow charlie has really yeah. gotten like a a, a much you know, bigger readership since I since I met him. He's yeah. he's really yeah he has really grown over the last two or three years for sure. I mean, yeah, that, just in terms of it, it's a stature. And um, yeah, that interior Chinatown. You know, before it got the when it won the National Book Award, like I think up until that point, it had been like kind of a disappointment sales wise, and yeah. uh, and then it just blew up obviously. So that really, you know, and then he sold it as a TV show. Yeah. Like no, I was, I, was, I was pleased for him because it's yeah. uh, that's a that's a brilliant outcome I think that's yeah and he's a, working with Taika uh, is producing it so yeah it's that it's going to be whatever comes of that it's going to be very interesting I think yeah um yeah, he co-wrote that pilot for uh, American Born Chinese too with his brother who was the showrunner on that oh, I hadn't appreciated that yeah his little brother is a tv writer too who worked on like Bob's Burgers and stuff but yeah. is now a showrunner so yeah pretty cool and, with regard to Night Fever, um, as we're having this conversation, the uh, the Forbidden Planet edition, which is a, which is a, a really nice uh, signed book, book plate edition. So thanks for doing that, guys. The book plate looks really nice, Sean. Um, Thank you. It's, it's that was the rejected cover. Yeah, right. So I, oh, I the photo. Was... Yeah. <laughs> Did you do? Was the book plate the photo? Uh... Or is the book plate the drawing of the photo? No, the book plate's the photo. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, I've done, I've, done feed, I've done feed book plates, so I can't remember which one was which. Yeah. Um, and that book plate edition is available from the links attached to our conversation uh, for anybody who wants to order the Forbidden Planet book plate edition signed by these guys. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful piece of work. Um, can you, I know that you've, you've already just about, and what we've just been talking about earlier is you've al already got your next project in the can, which is where the body was, but I'm guessing you don't really want to talk very much about that right here and right now. It feels weird yeah. to talk about one before the other one even comes out. 
<laughs> it had to be announced because of because of book publishing schedules. Yeah, um, but uh, I mean, it's amazing. I, I wish we could talk about it. It's <laughs> it's it looks amazing, and it's it's probably the craziest thing we've ever done. Um, well, I, I'm I'm looking so forward frozen. to it. Oh, no. what, what were you going to say, Sean? You no, thought it was saying, a great Dan? moment then, Sean, because you put your, your finger to your lips and that's when oh. you... <laughs> no, it's nothing to do with you. I was trying to get someone not talk to us. Oh. So I, uh, I, I think that would be, that would be a, a great source for another conversation further down the line. I'd like, yeah. to, keep this, I'd like to keep this all about Night Fever. And I guess my yeah. last question is about... Out in December. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll chat more about yeah. it on, on the road to publication. But I heard also, uh, did, did you write this in a kind of stream of consciousness way? Is that how it, did it just hemorrhage out to you? Night fever? Yeah. Um, A little bit. I knew the basics of it, but yeah, my notes for it were pretty light. And there were a lot of places where I did stuff that was different than what I thought I was going to do. And I just kind of let it go. But I, you know, I, I knew a bit more of, you know, I knew the ending basically. Uh, but I had like three different endings that that are in my notes when I was looking back at them. But yeah, the notes for this are probably twenty uh, percent as much as I would do. Whereas the notes for the next book, where the body was, is the longest. It's like an entire notebook, like eighty pages long or something. It's almost as long as the actual book. Wow. Um, so yeah, but this, but yeah, Night Fever was really one that just kind of came out of me, like scene by scene. Um, you know, writing it in early mornings before, you know, having to deal with other stuff yeah. um, every day and just getting to see Sean's art come in was like the real highlight every, every week. Um, Cause I, you know, I still, you know, I mean, I love the, the art that he's doing for where the body was too, but the, I think the, that uh, night fever is, you know, among the best stuff Sean's ever done for sure. I mean, oh, oh, so you're saying oh, I'm, getting, I'm getting worse. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, I think you're getting better, but I don't want to diss our old stuff. Okay, <laughs> the, the, the art that you've shared so far does look absolutely wonderful. Um, it, it really looks just right. the whole thing looks very exciting, mate. It really does. Yeah, um, the car yeah. chase scene is really amazing. Wait till you see that. Do you? It's do just... you... Oh, so, do, do you have your assembly version, Sean? You know, even though you've worked large on this, do you still do your assembly album? Your, um, your, your, sketchbook. Yes. your sketchbook version. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I still um, thumbnail it in a little book. Yeah. Do you want me to go and get it? It's over uh, there. Uh, uh, that's, I would yeah, to, that's exactly, if you don't mind. Yeah. I should have been more direct about that. that was a, I was a bit too obscure in my hint dropping then. Sorry. I love that. It's like, I know Sean's in his office, but it looks like Sean is in like the coolest uh, like, book nerd shop. bookstore. Yeah, it looks like you're in a bookshop. Whereas yeah, it really I'm, does. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, if if I were to move, you would just see a bunch of empty boxes behind me because I'm in an office. <laughs> Wait, show us the book, Sean. Yeah, so yeah, I always do my thumbnails in a little book. I get it printed. Um, so this is what was my first idea for the cover. Yeah. So I, I think do we use this for the book plate in the end? Yes. The, yeah, the book plate. Yeah. 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 A version of um, the book plate. Because I went to Milan last year and saw this really cool statue. We'd already started talking about um, Night Fever a year ago over a year ago so yeah. um i took loads of photos around milan of like stairways and arch doors and stuff like that and i didn't really use any of it in them because we didn't set it in italy in the end so yeah so i always get a little book made up of um with a grid on it there was a delete uh, deleted page there we had a quite we had a few deleted pages um oh yeah that's true yeah yeah and then um yeah so i just it's just oh, yeah, wow a good a good way to keep it all in one place for like the future yeah. you know when there's a sean phillips museum you know that'll yeah. Be kind of yeah. yeah um I, otherwise I you know, see that on the, you know, on, the, on the back of the script and i'll end up losing it i have so all my piece. this is my notebook i put i put the book i put the book plates on my notebooks for oh, the book this has got the reckless books four and five night fever and where the body was i think all in and at the or at least the first half of where the body was, I think, because I thought this is enough space. <laughs> Looking at all this wonderful work, do, do you think you'll do 
Do you think moving forward you're going to do more process additions like you did with pulp? Uh, you maybe down the line at some point. People don't buy the process editions as much as they buy like the deluxe editions. Yeah. Uh, it's it's definitely a smaller audience that really wants to see the, the like behind the scenes stuff. So pulp felt like the perfect one because it wasn't that long of a book. Uh, you know, and so yeah, I mean, all these other ones are twice the length, so it makes a even fatter, more expensive book, then doesn't it? Yeah, but I'd love to do some kind of coffee table, you know, book just sort of about all of our stuff and Sean's process and and stuff at some point, you know. Maybe if one of these movies or TV shows actually gets made, and you know, yeah. we have we have fuck yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Sean is Sean is even less optimistic than me. <laughs> <laughs> I was optimistic the first time twenty years ago, but yeah, it's still, yeah, right, it's okay. definitely worn off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard to. It's like I, you know, I, I feel like the pulp one has a really good shot because we have a writer director attached that I wrote the script with, you know, and everything he develops gets made. He doesn't. He's not one of those directors that has ten projects at the same time, like every other director in Hollywood. So. I feel like we've got a pretty good shot, but yeah, I'll I'll still believe it when you know when it's actually greenlit, and you know, yeah, I'll be excited if in the next month or so an actor gets it announced as being attached to it. Though I hope that happens after a strike is over. I I don't really want anything to happen with the movie during the strike at all. No, <laughs> quite no, quite quite rightly so. Yeah, as well. it put me yeah. in a terrible position. Yeah, <laughs> to to have to be both excited and not excited at the same time. <laughs> um, can, can we? Uh, is there anything in terms of so where the body was is your next book, and we'll talk about that at a later date. In terms of where you guys want to go next, do you have any like particular you know within the genres that you work? Do you have any particular areas that you feel like you really want to explore? Um. Well. Right now, I'm in the period of sort of trying to figure out what the what the next book will be. Usually during the last month of writing, I kind of start figuring out what feels like the right thing to do next. Um, but this time, because I was working on it while also like running the criminal TV show and writing the pulp movie because we were all headed for the strike. So... I hadn't had as much like free mental space until the strike to actually even finish the book. <laughs> so, so I'm kind of in this weird place of like having four or five different ideas competing in my head right now. Um, but yeah, I, the, the freedom of graphic novels, uh, I, I just feel like opens more and more with each one. And, you know, like after five reckless books in two years or whatever, two and a half years, like I, I really, felt like it was good to take a break and do something else uh we've talked about going back to reckless or maybe doing a criminal book or maybe just doing another just completely original thing so it's kind of you know we could i i also have a, an idea for a sort of a loose not a sequel but another world another uh book in the world of the fade out that would be like 10 years ah, later nice. yeah I was, um, I was gonna ask yeah, about that so right. hollywood in the 50s in a yeah it's just like i don't know if i feel like doing that right at this moment or if it feels as relevant you know at the moment as the fade out did that that moment but um but there's some you know the, that one's still calling to me a little bit um there were some elements of the initial plan for it that that got covered a little bit in um the tarantino once upon a time in hollywood yeah. but in like an early 70s era but like the the guy the actor and his stunt double thing was like gonna originally be part of the story because i knew a guy who was a a stunt man who was friends with an actor um but so i i might alter that if i do that but yeah i'm just sort of in the you know walking around you know daydreaming phase of it and uh i don't know if sean has what he wants to draw next yeah six weeks i've got i'll start in six weeks you gotta make up your mind soon what do you, I mean, what do you want to draw? <laughs> uh, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Five years uh, ago, you asked me for a romance comic and I finally gave you one. Yeah. Where, we did the, West, where the body West was West a little bit of a romance comic. Ah, more of one than, more of one than Junkies was. 
that was yeah. a great that was a great book by the way um my son i think i might have sent you a picture of this sean my son lives in a, a really nice place that he's got it in liverpool and that uh that's the, the cover um is of uh, junkies is the centerpiece of his like wall display you know? oh, wow. yeah, yeah. Cool, yeah. No, it's it, it's a it's a beautiful cover and i saw uh, it's some... a great piece of work I saw, like, uh, I was looking through book covers a year or two ago of, like, best book covers of the year, and I saw someone had done, like, a photo cover that was almost exactly, like, the same composition, but it was a photo of a girl, <laughs> like, and it was rated, and I was like, oh, this looks almost exactly like someone saw Sean's cover and was like, oh, let's do this with a photo. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, I mean, that, I was influenced by book covers anyway, we tried to make it look more like a book cover rather than a comic cover. So yeah, that's sort I of feel like we're going yeah, more that direction with every book we do. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, yeah. Like where I mean, the body was. Be... Wait, I mean, Night Fever and Where the Body Was. The final covers for those look more like just regular books than anything we've ever yeah. done. I think. Yeah. Well, Night Fever for sure does absolutely looks like a book cover, and it looks you know it's very very enticing for that reason. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, it looks lovely. And I, you mentioned Reckless. I guess the beauty of Reckless for both of you is in the same way that um, not so much like John D. McDonald, who really only ever went back to Travis McGee, but say like Lawrence Block, who's yeah. got, who was gone back to Matt Scudder throughout his career, but then has done lots of other stuff around Matt Scudder. Beauty yeah. of Reckless, right, is you can always go back to him, given the fact that, you, you know, it's, a, it's an extended snapshot, you know, decades from somebody's life, right? Yeah, that's the idea is that you could drop in at any point in his life up to modern times when he's like telling you the stories. I, it's funny because I have the idea for the seventh book really well figured out, but I haven't figured out the sixth book. So that's the that's my stumbling block there is like the, the seventh book can't be the sixth book. <laughs> it needs to be book seven, like structurally for me. Um, but it's also a much it's probably 50 pages longer uh the 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 notes I've got I'm looking at it I'm like there's no way to do this in the same so it's like Sean would need months more to draw it like I definitely would yes longer. don't forget yeah <laughs> so yeah I won't forget <laughs> <laughs> I like this but it's interesting the being really far ahead it, it felt weird to me to be talking about Night Fever right after like a couple weeks after finishing writing the next book after it but then I went back and I looked at it and I was like oh this must be what normal non you know because in comics you know a thing gets finished and it goes to print immediately usually like you know every the mainstream publishers you know send 100 books to print every thursday you know <laughs> and it's like and they're out they're out three weeks later um you know so it's for our, even with graphic novels we were two or three months ahead maybe you know yeah. on like of like we do the first one we did we we uh put out like we were shocked to find out that it needed an extra month to, uh, to be turned around because we just thought printing took the same for any book. And I was yeah. like, oh, no, hardbacks take an extra month to, you know, yeah. print, distribute. So, and now, you know, but now we're printing overseas. So we're, you know, six, seven months ahead of of being on the shelves. And uh, it's, it's great to have the time to actually, like, plan promotion and release and all that stuff whereas with monthly comics you're just constantly in the tunnel you're never there's no light at the end ever yeah um, yeah but, you, you feel like you're on that treadmill i mean yeah, you know exactly. at the time we publish comics and, and i know i edit books as well and uh, it's absolutely i think one of the beautiful things about the the prose process is exactly that that it's like this with the uh, the hard case books or say the max yeah. collins book mike hammer is, is a great example we've got a new mike hammer that's coming out fairly soon. I think it's publishing in a month or so. Dig two graves, but we, but that was completed over a year ago. You know, yeah. you have you know you, you then can go back in it and be quite disappointed. Yeah, all my all, all my novelist it. friends have always been really jealous of how fast I put stuff out, and yeah. uh, but I've always been really jealous of the fact that when they put stuff out, there's like you know. 50 articles about their book <laughs> you know? and it's like because they have a year to you know try to land and get the book into people's hands and you know so now we this was our first book we did an advanced readers copy for like the image yeah. you know because they had the book they printed thousands of you know paperback uh copies uh and sent them around to book buyers and you know went to book fairs with them and stuff and you know as a result, this is our highest ordered, you know, graphic novel up front so far. So, 
And yeah. that's been the trend for you, hasn't it, guys? Haven't your numbers kept on getting bigger and bigger as you've gone on? I think I think each new one, I'm not 100% sure on the advanced numbers on the last couple of Reckless books, whether they were bigger than the ones before or whether they were roughly the same. We, we print roughly the same uh, of every book at this point uh, that we've had to go back to print on the first Reckless book already. And we printed we printed more on the first one than we did on the second one. Um, just because we knew we were going to do a bunch of them and we needed the first one to be in stock. So I was surprised that when it sold out after like about a year, because I thought we'd printed enough to last, you know, two, two or three years. Um, but uh, but yeah, there it seems to be growing. And I hear from a ton of retailers that, you know, our, when our graphic novels come out, they're bought more like a, the new first issue of a comic or something, you know, like our, our fans show up for it. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's crazy to me when, retailers send me pictures where they've got a hundred copies, you know, some, some retailer yesterday posted a photo of, or a video of, of their kid helping stack the books and the stack of books is taller than the kid. (laughs) (laughs) But this is the, you know, it's like, I, I have to, every time I, that happens, I have to, you know, take a step back and be like, "We're, we're like the luckiest people in comics right now because we get to just do this. Like, you know, there are people who are more successful than us in comics, but I don't think anybody's do has followed the path that we've followed and just stuck together putting out these books. And, you know, like I, I'm always incredibly appreciative that we actually because this is the market that I think we always wanted to be able to do, just do graphic novels. Oh, yeah. Um, um, I think we start a- talking about criminal. We were in Europe talking about it. And, you know, in our minds, I think it was more like a European kind of model for comics so i feel like you know this is where we always wanted to end up and you know we've spent the last five years like sort of carving it out for ourselves and you know i'd love more people to come join us and do you know more graphic novels and <laughs> not, not on the same day though not on the same <laughs> day <laughs> no. no i don't want tom tom and mitch to put out a their first original graphic novel without yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they can do those in september yeah. <laughs> the thing is, guys, you've worked very hard and you've verily, very successfully like created your own niche. And I agree with what you've just been saying. I mean, I know looking at our Forbidden Planet numbers, like the event of publishing your new graphic novels, it's a real thing that the numbers burr out, you know. So uh, so, so thanks for joining it's... me to talk about Night Fever and to, to thanks for your candor about going behind the scenes. It's a, oh, been sure. very interesting <laughs> the way you put this one together. And again, for everybody watching this, it's available to order with the lovely book plate the guys have done for the links attached to our conversation. And uh, I can't wait to see what happens with the reception for this book. You know, kind of like the description alone and the the advanced pages I've seen are completely hitting me where I live in terms of the whole nightmare dreamscape of it all. So uh, I I just can't wait to get out there and there's, that's the other thing your fans are very very interactive we always hear a lot about your books once they're in the store oh good oh great yeah not being on social media other than my newsletter i get very little uh idea of this is the other part of the doing the comics is like you know when you don't know if they're any good until you show it to five friends that you trust it's like you always feel like you're just sending stuff out and you used to get emails from people but now it's all just people commenting on social media but with the newsletter I get a lot of feedback this one seems like I've gotten the most feedback from people of anything that we've done through the newsletter so far so it's kind of amazing hopefully they all like it huh? what, what did you say hopefully they all like it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and Dad, you've still got uh, you've still got Friday going on, haven't you? Yeah. Noticed? Yeah. Friday has. Uh, I'm working on the almost done with the second to last chapter of that, and then Marcos is drawing uh, chapter eight right now. But, so it'll, uh, it'll go to a find a, a third collection, is that right? And yeah. Yeah. Hopefully cool. we'll. Yeah, we're hoping to finish it this year still. So, thank God for the strike. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. And before before you go, I just want to mention something that came up on your newsletter the other week. We were talking about off camera. Um, 
this is my former music magazine publisher hat on, but your your wife has put together a brilliant video for the uh, the true August track, uh, Feel It in Stereo, which you can you link to. I know on your newsletter, we'll put the link here. It's available on YouTube. That's a, gr oh, that's a great pe that's a great piece of work. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I watched her work on that for about a year and a half. Uh, she hand animated the whole thing and the rotoscoping that she did was done in ones, which if you know rotoscoping or animation, that's an insane thing to do. But she wanted it to look as smooth as possible. Um, but also she really wanted to do rotoscoping in it because uh, Augie is related to uh, one of the guys from AHA. He doesn't like yeah. to talk about it, but I, do, I talk about it. So. <laughs> well, that, that's why the name of the band publicity. is great. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's I think that's his real name is True August. Uh, but I just know him as Augie. He's a, uh, he's a, uh, his wife is, or his mom, his mom is a friend of uh, ours and my wife and I's, um, which is how we, uh, that sort of ended up happening. She's part of our little movie club that my, my wife does these little animated films for our movie club every week. And so that, the, uh, the uh, music video sort of grew out of that, out of her sort of little, little hobby uh, of just teaching herself to animate through during the pandemic basically <laughs> and uh and then she spent a year and a half like really going overboard like doing this music video because she wanted it to be the most amazing thing ever and uh yeah i'm really i'm really proud of her for it yeah it, it, it it's a it's a lovely piece of work at and um you've given me yeah, a Pat thought Oswald about... texted me the other morning to tell me how much he liked it and said it he was like it's so beautiful but now i want like now I want big orb eyes to come down and turn all of our buildings into stereos. <laughs> it's funny because because Pat was on has been on this show a couple of times, and uh, one of the last times he was on talking about his own book, literally in the middle of his interview, uh, we ended up talking about your stuff for about five minutes. Yeah. Oh so, wow. So like he ended up talking about Sean and yourself for five minutes oh, wow. of his own interview about his own book. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so that's he's great. legit a big fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I've known him. My first date with my wife was a blind date to go see him do stand up. So that was and I met him not long after that because he was friends with Derek Robertson from like, I think Derek Robertson went to like college with him and Brian Fussain or something. So but yeah, I helped get him into comics like I got him uh, his for like his uh, first comic writing gig was in a, in a Batman annual that I I, that he did a story with Sergio Aragones. <laughs> it was like it was supposed to be like our story rejected from Plop in the seventies or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, yeah, I know him a bit. I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't see him very often because it's L.A. and you never see anybody. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I love Patton. His, yeah. uh, his stuff is it's amazing. And, and he's and he's a real enthusiast for, for comics for the whole form. Yeah, he's a legit nerd. Yeah, the last time I saw him in person, we just literally ran into each other at the comic store. So yeah, I was and I, I think I made a joke that like if we were if we were superheroes right now, we would be forced to fight. And he would just <laughs> accidentally run into another superhero in the in the yeah. line of duty. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> it's it's the classic Marvel seventies way. I mean, yeah, <laughs> he, he, he was telling me that what his kind of like, if he could play any comic book part, the character he would want to play would be the Wesley Dodds of Sandman Mystery Theater. And I thought that was kind of brilliant, actually. You know what I mean? Oh, wow. Yeah, he could pull that off. He could totally That'd pull it cool, off. Yeah. yeah. They yeah, don't let him do great. drama enough. I'm always trying yeah. to get him to in drama things and people are, are uh, you know, he's a yeah, comedian. Yeah, because he, he can legit act. Comedians are the, sometimes, the, yeah, I yes. mean, that movie right. Big Fan is so good. Oh, so good. Yeah. 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 Anyways. Uh, <laughs> Guys, on, on this movie note, given that we've segued into it, I'd like to close out on one thing. Could you both give, the, each of you, give the readers of this interview a movie recommendation? It can be anything that comes to mind. A movie recommendation? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. It, it doesn't have to be contemporary. It can be just something. Oh, um, just something. I can't remember the last time I saw a film. Um <laughs> <laughs> The last good film I saw was Dry Lane. Uh, that, like a, I've seen that too, and it's it's great, isn't it? Yeah, yeah the rom-com really set in Peckham in London. Yeah. Um, a young couple meet, and, they, and you follow them around for the day. That was really cool. I used to live there, so it's quite nice to revisit the area a little bit on screen. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, I think that's now available. I think it's on either Netflix or Amazon now. I it's on Netflix. Netflix. Yeah. Netflix, yeah, brilliant. It's That's a great piece of work. That's a good goal. I would recommend, I've been going back and watching a lot of Robert Benton movies, and I would recommend uh, both Twilight and The Late Show, which are both yeah. private eye movies about yeah. grizzled old private eyes at the end of their days. And one stars Art Carney and Lily Tomlin in The Late Show in the 70s, which I saw at the drive-in as a kid, I believe. Uh, and then Twilight is one of Paul Newman's last really great performances in his life. It's Paul Newman and Gene Hackman and Susan Sarandon and uh, uh, James Garner is in it as like another old private eye friend of Newman's and they're just great. And uh, yeah, I've been um, just, he, he, he co-wrote uh, Bonnie and Clyde and then became like a writer director in the early seventies after that with a really weird Western uh, starring Jeff Bridges. Um, trying to blank was on it, the name. Was that, that Bad Company? Yeah, Bad Company. Yeah. That's a fucking great film. Yeah, that's and a great the... movie. Yeah, yeah. I, I watched that because of working on the screenplay for Pulp with Tom McCarthy. Um, and uh, we went back and just were watching, you know, a bunch of old weird Westerns and stuff. And uh, I'd never seen that before. And then I realized, like, I'll, I'll, I'd seen all of Benton's movies without really connecting that this was all the same guy. And uh, so I went back and rewatched a bunch of his stuff. Yeah, because the thing about his work is he's one of those directors, a bit, Alan Parker was a bit like this. There's no yeah. real kind of through line between what they do. I mean, there, there's, it's yeah, he, not like he it's tried to do different genre. stuff every yeah. time, I think. And yeah, but he wrote and directed all, mo most of his own stuff. I think the only movie he didn't write that he directed was that uh, one about um, Bugsy Siegel, the Billy Bathgate. Billy Bathgate, yeah. Yeah, which is not my favorite of his movies. Um, it has but a good. It has cool. a good Bruce Willis performance in it. Yeah, it's got. It's, yeah, it's got it's some great gold. stuff in it. Yeah, it's got some great stuff in it. But yeah, I, I feel like Benton is sort of an underappreciated uh, crime writing master. Like, and uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to set up an interview with him before, you know. So. Oh could, yeah, get it done. Yes, that would be yeah. that. That now that would be great. And and Sean, yeah. you're absolutely right. Rye Lane is a bit of a mini triumph actually. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. and it's a it's a it's a lovely film. It's a great recommendation, uh, guys. Thanks for I spending. I really this enjoyed time. Fast X, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> which is the craziest movie of all time, where Jason Momoa is apparently dressed like a genie for most yeah. of it, as far as I can tell. It's the the most over the top. It felt like watching a whole mini series. Like, yeah. I had been holding back on that because I went to see Fast 9 with my son and we both thought it was so fucking ridiculous. By the time they got into yeah. space, I was like, I think I just might stop seeing these now. You know what I mean? But I mean, it, they're making the last, this one is broken into three movies apparently. So it's like, but yeah, I really, we watched the first one or started watching the first one after this. And I'm like, in the beginning, they're criminals stealing cars and smuggling drugs. And there's like, I think there might even be nudity in the first one. And this one is basically a kid's movie. Like they're there, they have like a scene where there's a hundred percent no way thousands of people didn't die, and they're like, no fatalities on the news. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> it's like if if Superman knocks over a building, they're like, miraculously, everyone escaped unscathed. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's pretty funny to me, but yeah, totally enjoyable, dumb uh, experience, but um, but also like how seriously they take every moment of it at the same time. Just, I, I don't know. I don't even understand when I'm watching it, whether I'm enjoying it facetiously or real, you know, like, and I think that that's kind of a, a, a amazing experience. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's kind of a glorious place to be. And it, it's almost, it, it's, re, it's like those movies relationship with human peril. They're like the mega budget equivalent of say, the A team, you know, where you'd have Kalashnikovs yeah. all over the place and car explosions, but you'd always see the bad guys dust themselves off afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody actually gets shot by those guns. Yeah, it's like if you, I don't know if you're an animation fan at all, but if you watch like something like Legend of Korra, whenever they were like shooting planes down, they had to show the like pilots getting out. And you're like, wait, what happened? And then, and then at some point they decided not to worry about that anymore. And it felt way more realistic that when they're blowing up buildings, people are probably dying inside. <laughs> you know, it's like not a bunch of people leaping out the window right as the building explodes. <laughs> so that's yeah, kind of funny. 
Well, that's a great place to, to, to close out, guys, with those epic, um, epic recommendations. And uh, uh, as I say, this we're recording this only a few days before it goes live. Um, the, our, our signed book plate editions of Forbidden Planet editions of Night Fever are available from the links. And uh, thanks for all your candor about the, bit, the process of creating this book. And uh, I look forward to chatting in the future. Um, yeah, about absolutely. your next one, which won't be too far away. So yeah. thanks very much for joining me and uh, take care of yourselves, both of you. Thanks. Thanks. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.